Hello, I'm Ted Gamble, Chair of the British Architectural Library Trust. The Trust is the nonprofit entity that supports the library and collections of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Today's lecture, the fourth and final program in our series on the work of Andrea Palladio, is entitled Palladio Inside Out. It will be presented by the internationally acclaimed architect, educator, author, and theorist, Peter Eisenman. He will examine Palladio's continuing influence and relevance to architecture going forward through his own provocative and discerning lens. Peter's extraordinary work has had a profound impact on architecture and the study of architecture for the past 50 years. He currently serves as a visiting professor at the Yale School of Architecture. This series of lectures is presented in conjunction with the RIBA's Palladio Project, a comprehensive reassessment of Palladio's drawings being undertaken in association with the Chisa Palladio and Vicenza. The project will provide unparalleled access to Palladio's work for a new generation of scholars, students, architects, and the public. Going forward, the British Architectural Library Trust will offer more web-based presentations, examining the work of other architects and topics relating to architecture and design. So please stay tuned. Peter will be more formally introduced by Barry Bergdahl, the Meyer Shapiro Professor of History of Art at Columbia University and the former Chief Curator of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Barry will also serve as interlocutor for the program. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Barry Bergdahl. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And we see already from the chat that people are listening around the globe, which is um, to be expected on a program I think as exciting as this one, where we're going to have a conversation and a confrontation with really one of the absolute major voices in 20th century architecture and early 21st century architecture, a major actor, provocator, thinker, builder, uh, educator of the last 50 years, confronting one of the major figures of the 16th century. So a dialogue across time, and as it turns out, also across space here in this Zoom format. Uh, it's a cliche that the speaker doesn't really need an introduction, but I think it is important to point out that already Peter Eisenman began not only designing buildings, but also writing and thinking about the theory of architecture, about the very nature of architecture, we might call it even the epistemology of architecture, and writing about historical figures with who he engaged in thinking about, about them, but also through them to think more globally and more fundamentally about architecture. So a body of writing, but also a body of design since the 1960s. He is also a great educator. He created a completely innovative approach to bringing together history theory and criticism, exhibition and programs, studio at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, which really brought New York, I think, into the architectural debate for the first time, probably in the history of American architecture in the 1970s and that thrived for a good 20 years uh, at the same time as he built buildings and exhibited designs for unrealized buildings, particularly the famous series of numbered houses, uh, but bringing us also the Wexner Center and the City of Culture in Galicia in Santiago in Spain uh, that changed the notion really even of what museum space uh, is about. So without taking up the whole hour to talk about Peter, we're gonna have Peter talk about Palladio and to talk about architecture with and through Palladio. And then I hope to interrupt him from time to time from my perspective <laughs> of a uh, historian. So interestingly, and I think he'll tell us about this, his engagement with Palladio, although it is now memorialized in his most recent publication, Palladio Virtual, uh, is one that goes back a very long time to his own um, period, first period teaching, uh, at Cambridge when he encountered Palladio uh, with the legendary Colin Rowe, but I'm sure something of that will come up. So this engagement with Palladio is almost as old as Peter's engagement with architecture, but um, over to you, Peter. Thanks, uh, Barry, and thanks, Ted, for inviting uh, Barry and myself. Um, I was told that I'm the cleanup hitter and we've got to make Palladio relevant to the, today's audience. Um, that was a great challenge and I'm not certain that I've done that, but I'm gonna give it a whirl. I have a four part 
talk, uh, maybe five minutes each part. And I've invited Barry to, you know, interrupt, uh, et cetera. And he, I was willing to cut several of the pieces out. And he said, oh, no, because that's where I'm going to get you. So I said, OK, uh, we'll have it out in public. Um, the four parts are part one is on postmodernism, part two is on Colin Rowe, um, part three is on Palladio, and part four is on metaphysics. Uh, if that sounds daunting, uh, it is to me as well. So uh, let's begin. There are two important trends as far as I could see in what is known as architectural postmodernism a period of thought as being between 1966 when Bob Venturi published Complexity and Contradiction and 1988 when the deconstructivist show at MoMA sort of finished off high postmodernism. One of these trends was figurative and playful with historical allusions uh, by someone like Charles Moore and uh, iconic of that time was uh, the Piazza d'Italia in 1978. Um, the second uh, was a more somber view of history, a postmodern classicism, if you will, as practiced by the Career brothers, Quinlan Terry and Alan Greenberg. And you see DuPont Hall at the University of Delaware by uh, Alan in uh, 2002. Um, for the most part, the, the second group were interested in the literal adoption of classical tropes, the idecule, the pediment, the cornice, etc. But what was so interesting to me watching, as it were, from the sideline is that time with which architects should be included in the postmodern classical canon and those who should be left out. The classical heroes were people like Sohn and Lutyens, and here we see Sohn's uh, Fitzhanger Manor uh, in England, uh, in London, in 1804. And uh, Lutyens uh, should be next. Lutyens. No. Um, this is Lachins in 1947, the Viceroy House in New Delhi. Um, and you can see the sort of classical influences and the uh, local influences as well. Um, the um, classical heroes, as I said, were Sohn and Lachins, but there was hardly a mention of Palladio, not to mention uh, other architects like Nicholas Hawksmoor and Sir John Vanbrugh. This is Christ Church Spitalfields by uh, Hawksmoor, and then by John Vanbrus, the one of my favorites, uh, Seton uh, Delaville. Uh, and to me, I could never understand why Hawksmoor and Sohn, I mean, Hawksmoor, Vanbrugh, and Palladio were left out of postmodern classicism. My answer to that, and upon thinking about it, has always been that there was always something difficult about Palladio that did not suit the taste of those who took on postmodernism in the classical or historical way. While they were elected, while they reacted against the kitsch sensibility of Venturian pop, they could not bring themselves to mind Palladio for his temporary contemporary value. Why this evidence of Palladio by the so-called postmodern classicists? Why? Because Palladio, avoidance, sorry, uh, why? Because Palladio, unlike Sohn and Lutyens, was seen as more difficult, not as easy to borrow from uh, as an architect. Palladio, therefore, in one sense, represents an already difficult synthesis of a concern for classical ordination and proportion with a mannerist edge. No longer pure and easily just digested and explained, even for the cadre of speaker uh, who say, a Palladio, it ain't easy. In fact, he is quite difficult. Now, what does this difficult mean? Um, that's part one. Uh, I don't know, Barry, if you want to interject or we'll go to part two. Let's segue into, into part two, although that, okay. that's, 
absence of Palladio from postmodern. Okay. Now the, the part two is Colin Rowe. In 1961, I saw my first Palladian villa on the screen, the Villa Pisani in Montagnana. I was traveling with Colin Rowe on summer break from Cambridge where we were both teaching. We had arrived in Italy from the north where Colin was going to show me his Italy. Our first stop was nothing more than a crossroads at the time uh, of uh, dusty uh, secondary roads. It was outside the walls of a town called Montagnana. And as I was to learn later, Montagnana is, uh, prides itself with a, uh, a kind of prosciutto that's not allowed to be sold in the United States. It's uh, only two prosciuttos that are manufactured can be sold and Montagnana's, which is very good, is not allowed to. All right. We stopped uh, on this some particular summer day and Colin pointed across the street to what you're seeing just like that. Uh, and after 29 years of thinking about uh, architecture, uh, I was confronted with one of my heroes, uh, Andrea Palladio, and this what looked to me quite ordinary uh, villa. Uh, it was uh, Colin saying to me, and this I remember uh, forever because it has geared my whole thinking about Palladio. He said, I want you to go across the street and look at the facade and tell me something about that facade that you cannot see. Uh, and I couldn't believe what was I to do. I saw the uh, windows, uh, the three bays. I saw the, the entablature. I saw the pediment. I saw lots of things but I couldn't say what I couldn't see. And this bugged me for all of my work uh, because I was determined to find out what it was after a certain amount of time that could be said. And I came back because I'd been seeing Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe. Uh, we had seen Giuseppe Tarani and, and Como, and this was my first Palladian villa. And I said to Colin, so what's the big deal? And he said, at some point, you'll find out. Uh, part two, anything you want to say about that, Barry? Well, I do, I do want to have a discussion with you about uh, Colin Rowe and that story, but also how you position your analysis in relationship to his classic uh, ideal villa. I think there are many themes there that we'll want to discuss. Well, and we're going to do probably that online know, know that, but it's up to you whether you want to interrupt already to have that discussion. Or well, I want to make sure I don't. Uh, I want to make sure I don't shut you out. And we're going to go to the uh, drawings. Okay, what I want to say now that first two parts were sort of background. All architecture that is worth worth calling itself architecture, as opposed to building, must concern itself with ideas ideas about architecture. This talk will argue that throughout history, architecture has always been about its own discipline, as has painting. And this can be seen in Botticelli's Annunciation is great, not because of its depiction of a narrative rather, but rather because of the way it is painted. Uh, and what's important to me is if you notice the hand of the Gabriel, the enunciating angel, uh, the hand, it looks like it's pushing the window or the door open. Uh, and it, it lines exactly up with the edge of what would be a part of the door. And the question is clearly what's interesting is the angel is nowhere near the door but because of the painterly illusion, the two-dimensional possibility of moving things about, it looks like the arm is touching the, the door, which means that the door is right next to the arm or vice versa. The angel has, is closer than we think. So there's an ambiguity and a, a question as to what uh, Botticelli uh, was saying, and what he was saying was, it's possible on a painterly canvas 
to uh, make space compress and extend. And that's what uh, we're going to look at with the Palladian um, view of Villa Pisani. Okay, next. Now, what my argument is going to be, Barry, as you, you and I have been over it, is that there are certain, I wouldn't call them norms, but uh, regularities, let's say, in the Palladian uh, book that uh, uses three types of space. One, which is on the top, a light gray, uh, is a portico space uh, as an integer in composition. The second uh, B is a transition or a circulation space. There's always, because in the Palladian drawings, unlike any of the other uh, architects that we might know, there were no corridors. There were uh, an ensuite uh, gathering of rooms that you move from room to room rather than room to corridor to room. Um, and there was the transition space that moved you uh, between the portico uh, and the main ceremonial space C, which you can see. And what I'm going to argue and that's amazing for me in Palladio is that uh, these three things recombine in Palladio in various ways, uh, but are always present and they allow for the first time in architecture for what could be called a heterogeneous as opposed to a homogeneous space. That space before Alberti, and Alberti is slightly before uh, Palladio in 100 years or so, um, uh, in Alberti space is mentioned for the first time. It wasn't mentioned in Vitruvius. But the space that Alberti was talking about was homogeneous space. And Palladio for me is the first person that takes and superposes uh, A over B and B over C in various ways to produce a heterogeneous space where the two conditions exist simultaneously and in, infect the space in a way very different than space had been conceived before Palladio. Next, please. So if Palladio were doing it, what would be a classical villa, and none of his villas are exactly like this, you would have a portico, uh, a transition space, a central space, a rear transition space, and a rear portico. Uh, many of the villas uh, have this uh, assemblage of, of pieces, but not quite in this order where there are a series of what I would consider in the neutral or ideal sec section uh, homogeneous space. The portico in white is homogeneous. It doesn't infect the gray transition space. Uh, it's homogeneous. And the uh, central space is also homogeneous. Nothing like this exists in Palladio. Next. There, to show this, the Villa Conaro in 1552, uh, Palladio in a town called Piombino Dese, uh, <coughs> has, as you can see, a portico, uh, six column portico, double height, a uh, double story portico with a pediment, uh, usual, and it's recognized as a portico. The second is the transition space which you can see reaching out the staircases that move up. And then the main space, uh, which is next. Uh, you need your plan, which is next, yeah? Yeah, I don't control this. No. There you go, all right. So you see uh, the portico, part of the portico, uh, usually a square and plan, the transition space, the circulation, and then the main space, which is usually uh, has uh, articulated uh, surfaces, uh, which we could call pochet or uh, columns. So you can see the 
the only columnar space, the only Porsche or shade space is this uh, central space. Next, please. Right. And so what you get in Piombino Desi in Villa Conaro is that the uh, portico is pushed partway in, causing this red hatch, and it sits over the transition space. The same with the rear, the Villa Conaro pushes into uh, the transition space, causing this uh, red hatch on the uh, central space which cuts it down from its uh, square plan to a rectangular plan. So what you have is both of these spaces are inhabited by double readings. Um, and uh, they uh, confound a homogeneous space. They produce what could be called a uh, heterogeneous space. And then you see the, the Calibration is A, A over B, C, A over C, A. So even with the calibration, uh, the thing does not become uh, uh, symmetrical about the central axis. Next. Um, now, what you read on Villa Pisani to start with is a portico. And what's interesting is that if you take the idea of a portico as one of the counters of all Palladian architecture, and it's pushed into the facade, we see uh, this, the, the tracing outline of a portico uh, with its pediment, uh, and it's a four column portico. Um, and it's also on a two story, but it's pushed into the facade. So what Colin was asking me uh, was, could I read the portico as being pushed into the transition space in the Villa Pisani? Clearly, uh, 50 years ago, I couldn't do that. I can do it quite easily today. And I can't get the idea of the portico pushed in out of my mind. Once I know that there is a portico that's inhabiting the transition space, um, I, I am fixated, let's say, on this double reading. Next. Um, now here's the re rear because there's also a portico. Uh, this portico is pushed into the uh, facade, but in a different way than the front of the building. This is the garden facade and it cuts out a porch in so that truly part of the portico, part of the square plan uh, can be seen, it's only half of that square plan. So you've got one, a, an A in, in the front, uh, but in the back, you have an A over B. Um, and so the difference in the notation between the portico in the front and the portico in the rear. Next. And you can see the plan uh, echoes that. The, the plan shows that there's no portico out front, but there's a portico in the rear uh, here, which overlaps the B Bay. Uh, and it, wait, right. uh, yeah, next, you can go to the next. Okay, so here we have the portico uh, uh, and the A, the B is the transition and the C as uh, a basic setup. Uh, and how did it get to be like this next? So what happens is that you get the portico, which is outlined in this red, uh, pushes into the main space and this portico pushes in, um, but it also, the portico in the rear leaves and trapped half of the portico form where it disappears in the front. And that's important. And, and that gives you a, this complex reading uh, of A, C, B, A uh, as a basic beginning next. And then you get the actual villa where the two porticos, one in hashed red and the other in full red uh, appear. And you get A over C uh, over the main space in the front. You get A over B, the uh, 
uh, portico over the transition space, and then you get a fraction of an A in the rear. So that's a, a reading, very complex reading, that is clear when you're there that it's not just A, B, C, B, A as a, as, let's say, a classical villa would be, but this very complex uh, reading of A over C, A over B, A. Um, I want to be the stop there uh, before I go to the fourth part uh, and ask Barry if you want to hop in. Yeah, I have a lot that I'd like to. What remind me what the fourth part is? What the what? The fourth part. Oh, the fourth part is going to take us to metaphysics of presence. I the think fourth part is the metaphysics of presence. I think it's a good. I think it's a good place to to um to stop. Yeah. And I, in fact, we're going to then leave people with a question that must um be on their on their minds. Why does a uh, a major? Hi, my art, let me just conclude one thing, Barry. Okay. My argument to the audience would be that this production of Palladio is a way of overcoming uh, the concept of the metaphysics of presence, which is the animating epistem for architecture and thought uh, in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, that is the overriding uh, principle. And this is a critique of that because it questions presence as being uh, as a necessary condition. And of course, what this is saying is that presence is now laced with absence, a kind of uh, different view of what presence is. So that's yours. Okay, so we have Gary Dodd just outside the screen here, but um, yeah. <laughs> let, uh, let uh as well as my cat let's um let's divide that's excellent peter because that's really where i wanted to go maybe we can divide the conversation for a moment into two parts and be mindful of the time so that we get to the um the hefty, we got, we got the hefty hint time. you just gave us because that is in your comments at the end are going to or that you just made are going to, I think, be what's on everybody's mind. What would motivate you to really engage with Palladio with this incredible uh, depth as a uh, practicing architect and theoretician of architecture? But maybe we just hold that in abeyance for a moment. Uh, and uh, since this is a series on Palladio, so we'll start with Palladio and then we'll move to Eisenman and the larger prospect of architecture through Palladio. But um, I, I want to go back to, well, you had this wonderful quote that sort of set up this conversation already in the book. You said, an architect sees differently than does an art historian or a critic. So, um, and I would agree, but on how can we each help the other to see? That is the question, I think, for an art historian reading your work as opening insights into Palladio, or for that matter, into Peter Eisenman, or for that matter, into another architect. But what I want to be quite concrete at the moment, because you, you've left us with a bit of a bombshell uh, right in the middle of this uh, hour-long uh, seminar. Are, are you suggesting that we have an anti-classical Palladio as you've taken, you've taken a, you know, one would think over and over again, so often you think of the Palladian um, space as evolving from some central space. I think that this is pretty much what's implied in Rudolf Wittober's uh, uh, famous and much discussed book of 70 years ago, Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism, this central space, this center for the human and the classical that works out from that, or for that matter, um, the ideal villa uh, of Colin Rowe. So I think there's a, there's a historiographical lineage in this, but um, so I guess my question is, you have, you, you have reinvented a Palladio for us that it might be difficult to square with some of the other Palladios not only that are in your own intellectual genealogy from from Bitcover to 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 row, but that are also um, out there for us to uh, to read in a James Ackerman or a Howard Burns. Um, who is the who is this Palladio that you are? All right, crafting? I think that's a real fair question. What I raised uh, quickly, uh, passed over it, is the question of Pochet. 
and the, there's not supposed to be any poche in classical architecture, I mean, in modern architecture, yet I think there is. And what I'm saying is, first of all, is that Wittkover's drawings, his diagrams of the villas is, are line drawings. It doesn't take into account any kind of poche as front, back, uh, as a notational system. I'm arguing that Palladio's main space is always the pocheted space and the other spaces are not. Uh, so I, I would say that's one thing that's already different than, than Wittkover. What I'm also saying is that Sohn and Van, I mean, sorry, not Sohn, Van Bra and Hawksmore and Palladio are on the same, they're not anti-classical, they are a deviation, let's say, or disturbance of classical, but they're still within the classical tradition. So if you're going to have, if you're going to give me Hawksmoor and Vanbrook, then you've got to give me Palladio uh, as dis disturbance of what might be the classical canon. And what makes them interesting, I would then go further and say is that all architecture that is interesting is a disturbance of what is assumed to be a classical canon. And that's where you and I uh, are going to run into each other because you're saying I'm, I'm arguing on the one hand, there's no such thing as a classical canon, but I'm using a classical canon to understand the disturbance that uh, Vanbra, Hawksmore and Palladio produce. You're giving, away the fact, you're giving away the fact that we've already discussed this. Um, the, um, <laughs> But what, it's something that you said today really intrigued me. So I, you, you wanted to set up this absence of Palladio in postmodernism, that it's kind of high moment, distinguished mm. types of, uh, of postmodernism for us. Uh, and you use the term uh, double reading, and then you showed us some many different types of double readings that you are able to see in analytic exercises uh, through the Palladian corpus of villas. Um, but I think, well, somebody of my generation, when you hear double reading, you think also of Venturi, complexity and contradiction. I didn't do my homework to see if Palladio was actually um, indeed missing from that, uh, from complexity and contradiction or not. But I wonder if you could just he elaborate is, on what would, he is, what he would is be the difference? He's not there? You know, what's so interesting is that I would say Bob Venturi's book is very close to what I'm talking about. But the figures that he mentions, uh, he mentions Santa, Santa Maria and Campatelli, but not in the same way that I talk about it. He mentions Luigi Moretti, but not in the same way that I talked about it. In other words, so his idea of complexity and contradiction is, is very close to what I'm talking about, but uh, I don't think it leaves intact the, what I would think of as the classical residue. I, I think Bob uh, goes off into, I've, I've, I've always admired the book. I can't get, get the architecture necessarily. Yeah. Uh, and I think that Luigi Moretti and um, uh, Carlo Rinaldi, to men named two, are two of the people that he talks about, uh, but in a different way than I'm proposing we look at Palladio. It's interesting that you say that because I'm trying to answer the, I jotted it down the minute you said it and I was trying to answer it myself and I would have answered it slightly differently and you may, maybe you'll push back on this, but I also think it leads us to another um, conversation I'd like to have with you, which has to do with the possibility of a double reading where things both mean what they refer to in the past. In other words, the portico actually does refer to the ancient Romans, refers to Palladio's time in Rome, drawing the Roman baths, and also is creating this uh, new type of heterogeneous space that you're talking about. But I, I would say that for me, maybe this is a superficial reading, a Venturian double reading is often has to do with compositional overlaps in facade. It doesn't have the type of, uh, uh, right. of, spa of spatial reading, and it's not read, and you know, it goes right back to that question of Roe asking you, what is it that you can't see? Your double reading also is implied uh, things, things that are actually um, not right. literally 
readable as two systems that are happening on the on the face of the face of it. So that the it is these analytics that produce the possibility of the the double reading. So I don't know if you agree with that reading of what you're saying, but I, what I really want, where the direction I want to go to this is, in my rereading of the book to prepare for today, the thing that continues to um, a little bit disturb me as a historian is that I uh, I don't see why you need to throw out the baby of iconicity in order to, you know, you're so determined that the portico is no longer a portico. It's not referring to the ancient Romans. It's not meant to be read as a sign of classical culture because it's going to go through these complex manipulations to produce heterogeneous space. I, want, I, I, I keep when I'm reading it saying, why can't it be both things at the same time? Why, but why, if, if it can be both things at the same time, why can't it be just my reading as well? Why can't there be an A reading, an AB reading, and then a B reading? See, I, I don't know why it upset. What's interesting to me is the reading that I'm proposing uh, is not Colin Rowe's reading. It's not Vitkover's reading. It's not your reading. It's another reading. Why isn't that possible? Um, and why should it cause uh, disturbance in people like, I mean, uh, I, I'm prepared to believe it, that it is about not being able to see. It's physically not uh, something you can see. You can only understand mentally what that means. I didn't see the portico pushed in uh, in reading the first time I saw this villa or the second time for the third time. It took mm -hmm. me a number of times. Don't forget, I've been working on Palladio and, and other architects uh, trying to understand a different way of look, uh, looking at. My basic critique is a critique of the metaphysics of presence. Now that either you're going to accept that as an overriding epistem in terms of how you look at things. And if I'm saying, I, I got to question that, Barry, uh, that the metaphysics of presence is something that we've got to look at because it colors all of how you think and how I was taught to think. Uh, but what deconstruction does, uh, it says uh, that it's uh, a, 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 pr a preferred way, a prejudiced way of seeing. In other words, it, it gives A more importance than B. And what Derrida was trying to say is that A, presence, and B, absence, are equal phenomena mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not with a priority. And so that the metaphysics, the metaphysics being the existing epistem, uh, favors presence over absence. And what I've tried to do in a certain way is to bring absence up equal to presence. That's the key question. So they both can exist. Yes, they can. Yeah, because but there are numerous. I don't know how many people listening online have had been able to to read the book. Unfortunately, we're not at a book party where you could um, they could go home with it and sign it. But you are over and over again uh, underscoring. Say, you know, I want to strip the portico of its iconicity. And then you ask, and I, bet, I guess the question is, is this simply a thought experiment or can we hold both images in our mind in a kind of gestalt-like way simultaneously, you say? Could we see Palladio devoid of the science of classical antiquity? So I think that's... Um, yeah, but I, I, I can see him devoid of those uh, signs. You, you may not be able to, and I think that's fair. Uh, but I, what I'm questioning is, uh, why it's not possible in your world that someone like me could exist or people like me, because this isn't Colin Rowe's world, it's not Vitkova's world. It's uh, a world that I believe, given deconstruction and what it stands for. In other words, deconstruction is basically saying that there's a free play of signifiers and, and, and signifies. That is, it's play. Uh, and that there's no hierarchy, et cetera. This is the, the dominant thing. Uh, it's the actual evocation of structure. 
uh, and it is the free play of, and that's what gets me all the time, that there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between an object and the, its representation. It's free floating. So let me continue in my ignorance. Can you explain, and I, I'm going to guess that there are some people online who would maybe ask the same question. How can you say that there's an implied portico and then it's no longer the portico? You need to think of it as a portico in order to imagine that it's been pushed into something. That's right. You, so you actually have in your mind a concept of a portico. You've got a shape for the portico. You've got a possible dimension for the portico. And then you imagine that it is actually, um, you know, it, it, it's not immediately visible. It's absent in some way and it's registered inside. And from that begins this, um, derivation of a heterogeneous interlocking overlapping layered layered space okay i agree with all of that can you but why sh should that be a, qu a question i mean it could be but this is the art historian speaking it seems so insistent that it's no longer uh, iconographically a portico that it's not I, making well, reference you're the to one, the but Barry, you're stressing that i i i i just say it exists as, I mean, it's not part of my, the, the deconstruction uh, idea. It's not part of Derrida's thought, let's say, that they both register equally. They register as absence and presence equally, but not in terms of the relation of the sign to the signifier, signified, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And that's the key issue. If, yeah. if, if Palladio was going to be relevant today, it's not stylistic, it's not the actual space, it's the concept of the space. Uh, and I'm saying that the drawing that we're looking at there can be read uh, today more easily because of Derrida's work, let's say. Um, that's how I got in. Don't forget, mm -hmm. when I first started on this, I was a bit covering. Uh, yeah, although I, I would say, you know, I have the pleasure numerous times of putting on the wall the drawings of how, I think it's how six at MoMA, in the MoMA collection. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think of those analytic drawings, and I, can, I don't know the exact date in which I became deeply engaged with Derrida and even worked with him at a moment. Later. But later. And yeah. those drawings are already operating in this, and they already, in some ways, I think, predict this analytic approach. I would agree, because Derrida said to me, why do you need me? You're already doing it. <laughs> I mean, in one of his, <coughs> it was really interesting. One of my interchanges with him, uh, we did a project together in Bernard Schumi's La Villette, project he gave us a garden to do uh, and I produced a, a drawing of a garden and he said how can how can there be a garden without trees and benches and shade and places for people to sit and I said where's the shade in your books Jacques I said there is no shade there's no room to move in your books uh, it's like a garden without trees you're writing uh, so, you know, uh, I, th I think that what these things are about, and I'm now going back and doing Alberti, I'm working on a book on mm -hmm. Alberti, where all of this I'm saying is, it didn't just happen with Palladio, it happened also with Alberti. Uh, and I can't trace it any further back, but uh, I, th I think you can see in uh, the five major buildings of Alberti, these traces of this kind of capacity, not that they were doing it, but the idea of heterogeneous space, as opposed, I mean, why is it there are no books before Alberti that talk about space and only marginally is the question of space. And if space is the dominant condition in architecture that's different than Spain, than painting, let's say, literal mm -hmm. space. Um, why was it ignored for so long? Because it's a difficult concept. Yeah, well, actually in, I mean, 
the curmudgeon will say, well, there aren't that many books before Alberti, but um, that, but I think your point is actually um, verified by the fact that in the history of architecture, space is not postulated uh, as a central concept until the late 19th century. So you've got right. over a half, you've got more than a century of art history from Winkelmann through maybe Zemper is the first person who begins to really postulate space rather mm -hmm. than structure or composition as a kind of fundamental uh, of, uh, of architecture. I, I wanna make sure that your part four is not going to be, um, did you wanna elaborate no, no, on part four? No, you've okay. got- we've, we've discussed we've part yeah. four is what we've been discussing. So you, so I'm fascinated that you said now that you would extend to Alberti, I wondered if you would extend it in the other direction because I remember being invited now many years ago by you and Michael Graves to come down to Princeton when you did a semester long uh, studio. Um, you were doing well, a sort of precedent um, sequences. You had done a Serlio, I think at Harvard and then you did Schinkel uh, at Princeton. Um, well, do you think you could extend it to, to Schinkel or have you not thought enough I, about Schinkel? I don't know Schinkel, I mean, yeah, I have attempted to uh, do it with Schenkel, and uh, we invited you down because of your then recent book, as I remember. Um, and uh, I think, look, Barry, let's take Barry Bergdahl versus Wittgover. You are a disturbance to in the, your reading of architecture to Wittgover. Would you agree? You're not a Wittgoverian. No, uh, I'm not. And so if I'm a disturbance to Colin Rowe, it's a similar role that we play, uh, questioning uh, mm -hmm. being. I have to give you just a personal thing which you'll like. When I studied at Columbia before your time, uh, Vitkover had an office in, in, the, in the Art History Building in Shermerhorn on fourth or fifth or sixth floor, I can't remember. And next to him was a man called Robert Branner. And yeah. I was Robert Branner's TA. And I was studying, when I went to England, I was studying Gothic cathedrals and the fourth nave bay at Salisbury Cathedral, which had an aberrant condition. I was working not for Wittgover, but for Branner. And I finally threw it all over uh, for going with someone like Wittgover as opposed to Brenner and Wittgover are the two polar opposites in my existence. Uh, I don't know if you knew Robert Brenner. I um, no, he died before my time, but I know know his work for sure. Yeah. Um, I would be just mindful of the of the time. We should give the people their yeah. questions. And there, I, I just glanced into the chat. There's a kind of um, parallel seminar going on trying to figure out these uh, things. It's almost as though a, a very high level philosophical game show going on um, in the chat. So I should turn to it in a moment and see if we might extract any questions. Or what I could say if people have burning questions is they put, put them in the chat now and we'll look only at the most recent entries for perhaps to- Why don't you our... put the questions, Barry? Yeah. Uh, I, just wanna, I just wanna ask you, you said next might be to extend this to Alberti, but I wanna ask you, how does this feed back into ongoing work of design for you? Oh, that's a really difficult question. I think it's a fair question. Um, we would have to go through my work. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, um, the things that I'm interested in, in, in architecture, let's, for example, in modern architecture, I'm interested in Corbus five points and especially the question of the ground. Uh, and what's interesting is how he treats the ground as opposed to Mies. Mies is always making a, a sacred, uh, it's either a plinth or a depression, et cetera, but it's never the actual ground. And Le Corbusier, takes the house off the ground in, in Piloti and says that uh, the ground is public. Uh, it's really a really interesting difference. And so I've always been concerned with whether I'm going to make a plinth uh, as a ground condition or I'm going to make a free plan uh, on Piloti. 
Um, and I think uh, the question of the ground, whether it's a mound or, or mounded up or plinth, uh, is something that is in section, not in Le Corbusier too much or in Mies or in Palladio. So I would say that my work is much more interested in section beginning with the ground and the roof, let's say, uh, than anything uh, that I might find in Rinaldi or uh, Palladio. I think I'm more interested in Moretti uh, as a figure and Tarani, clearly. Uh, I've been able to work analytically with those figures, but what they have to do with my work is a real question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to um, not hog all the space, although I still am intrigued by the discussion we had the other day when we were talking about having this discussion, um, right. which is uh, bringing back the experiential nature of the space, which I think has a lot to do with the perception, even if you're not looking up at it, that you feel about the way that a space is roofed. Uh, and and um, therefore not not having the vaulting plan uh, here really um, change, uh, to me changes things. But this, I, I think anybody who wants to get engaged with the book will want to continue to have this conversation. And there are, I want to just extract from uh, the chat seminar that I hope that the BALT is going to keep if I can. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to say, if you look at the, the Holocaust Memorial, what's interesting about the Holocaust Memorial, it's all about ground. It's about the connection between the actual ground and the height of the pillars. And you can't see the height of the pillars because they're over your head, but the space, the chunk of space that it's talking about is a volume of space that cannot be calibrated by experience. You have to know this, uh, in advance to know what that relationship and the pillars are merely the, the marking connection between the surface, the top surface and the ground surface. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so a lot of people read the Holocaust Memorial in a very different way, but I'm saying that has nothing to do with the relationship of experience to uh, the space, that the experience to the space can only be known afterward. Can I, yeah, can I read you something from the chat, which I think is interesting? Sure. This is, I think this must have been posted when you were going through the um, the uh, demonstration of um, of Pisani. Um, and it's Ax Axel Paredes who writes, unlike the rear portico that generates a new space inside, the front portico disappears since there are no spatial definitions or quote unquote traces of a portico on the central space. This presence of absence that recalls a narrative in reading, are, there, are these traces then seen on the facade? Does it mean that the facade detaches itself as a reference to the space inside? The, the, it is the plane of reading. The facade is the re re reading of the traces. Uh, you, you, that's why I say inside out, uh, because uh, you, you, you go in in order to realize that the way you read the inside is from the outside. Um, whether it is, I mean, that's my interpretation, whether it holds up or not, I don't know. I'll read you one more that, um, there's so many that I can't really extract from them all, but here's one. Is in the Villa Pisani diagram, how is the portico projection determined such that it's cubic and overlapping with the transition zone versus a, happily we still have the shared scribe here. So how is the portico projection determined such that it is cubic and overlapping with the transition zone versus a rectangular volume cleanly adjacent to the transition zone? So I guess they want to know how, I mean, this is, this is obviously the key to it for your heterogeneous spaces that you get these implied overlappings. Well, first of all, one of the things, as you pointed out, there is no discussion of, of section and of the vaulting in the, in the room. So uh, a lot of what would be articulated, I'm certain in that main space, the vaulting are, leaves traces 
that can be understood with the facade. I, I can't specifically say, but as I remember it, the main space, the pochade space, uh, also has uh, articulated vaulting, which uh, would give you the pediment and the uh, main space as a as a dual reading. I uh, I can't be for sure, but as I remember that space, but it's not part of the analysis. Um, we could flip, is there anything you want to ask me? Um, yeah, I mean, I want to continue. I think this has been a great opportunity to put something out. And uh, I, I think that the, the book is, has lots of interesting insights into how you can think of deconstruction, uh, which I think is a major philosophical condition attacking uh, the metaphysics of presence. And because Derrida argues that architecture is the locus uh, sine qua non of the metaphysics of presence. That's what architecture has been. And what Derrida and Shumi, myself, Liebeskind and others were trying to say is that in fact, it's something quite other uh, when you look at it through deconstruction uh, lens. And I think that's what the MoMA show, if we look at the difference between the MoMA show of 88 and what was going on with decon, I mean, with uh, postmodernism, it's a really a radical shift. I mean, the, the envelope, uh, I mean, if you look at Liebeskind's work, you look at Gary, look at Kuhlhaas, the envelope, which was always present in postmodernism uh, as a vehicle, is gone, the in containing envelope. And that is the beginning of where you get these shards of, of, of space. And uh, I think it's it, comparing postmodernism with deconstruction is really an important uh, thing that needs to be done. Uh, and the one is the enclosing for the frame, I would argue is the, the sine qua non of presence that, in other words, the necessity of frame is to contain presence. Once you take the frame away and the enclosing in the enclosure, uh, then you're into absence as uh, in a very different sense than it was portrayed, let's say, um, in classical work. Anyway. that I think what you just said, um, if I had the transcript of it, I would put it at the back of the book because the one thing I regretted was that there wasn't a conclusion. Much of that is implied in the introduction where you're setting up the problem and giving us some sense of why there is a 20th, 21st century uh, set of stakes in this project. Um, although I do think it, uh, I do think it's such a provocative reading of Palladio that it does take you back to the 16th century and think if I go on to Serlio, am I going to see anything like this? I'm not so sure I am. I might see something quite different, but I don't think you're going to see anything uh, like this. If I go on to the followers of Palladio, am I going to see things like this? Often not. So I think in addition to not, I wonder if, um, you know, Take Lord Burlington, take Neo-Palladianism, take some of the other Palladianism that has appeared in the in the in the in this series. A lot of it, I don't think, would be susceptible to this right. type, the type let of analysis. Let me say one last thing, even though I'm very fond of Howard Burns and I have always admired his work. When I first gave a studio at Harvard or second time at Harvard, uh, Howard came into the studio and he said, What is this studio about? And I, what, what it was about was Serlio. Um, and I said, Serlio. And Howard immediately said, he's not an architect. That'll put you back a few paces. Uh, but that's what he said at the time, that Serlio is not an architect. And it's that kind of contradiction that I've been facing a lot. Uh, because people like Michael Graves, who was my best friend, um, we worked a lot together, wouldn't recognize Serlio or, or Vignola necessarily, or 
uh, Rinaldi. I mean, my God. Uh, and it's so clear to me in painting, that's why I wanted to show the Botticelli, but we could have easily shown a Parmigianino or a whatever, Bronzino, et cetera. And for me, Barry, what's important is what you bring to this world and what I would like to bring to my students. You've got to be within the culture as a student of architecture. You've got to be able to look at different ways of looking at Vitkover or Rowe on Palladio. You've got to look at different ways of looking. Uh, I just reread uh, Mark Wigley on uh, deconstruction because I assigned it for reading this week. You've got to be educated to be an architect and to be an ar architectural historian. And to me, that's the value of this discussion today is it's part of a larger uh, pedagogy uh, about architecture. So I thank I'm, you for being I, a good I critic. Think that I think I'm going to hand it back to, to Ted because that is a superb ending, not only to this encounter, which I've enjoyed greatly. Thank you, Peter, but also for the whole series. So yeah. I can it back to Ted. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to thank both Peter and Barry for uh, a truly extraordinary program. I'd also like to thank our audience for their continuing support of this series and on the work and influence of Andrea Palladio. More information on the British Architectural Library Trust and a link to sign up for future events and programs can be found on the organization's website, the baltrust.org. You can also follow the trust and see material from the RIBA's collections on Instagram. Thank you all for joining us. Can I talk to Barry? Barry, are you there? I am. Yeah, th I thank you. I mean, it was a, a bit jumbled, but uh, I thought it was really, uh, we got at it. I think it's really fun. I think we have to have a follow-up over drinks. <laughs> yeah, we should have a follow-up. I, I would love, because there are lots of things we need to talk about. The question of iconicity uh, troubles me a lot. Um, and maybe I overstress uh, as Derrida as the free play of of signs, uh, and he he would argue that deconstruction is motivated by play, uh, and is the the, the jouissance uh, mm -hmm. of of signs and uh, important, and um, I I I like that I. <clears throat> never found Jacques to be playful, but uh, certainly the question of the, the I'm I'm writing a long paper. It's called the becoming unmotivated of the sign, uh, and the sign's motivation is the metaphysics of presence. It's the fact that presence is the one that records. Uh, and I'm trying to unmotivate the idea of the sign, which is detaching the sign from the thing. Um, and if, if we look at um, Alberti, for example, he's the first one that says um, that uh, a column shouldn't just hold something out it must look like Alberti in, in, in a sense says this, which means that it must be both a thing and a sign of itself uh, to be a column. Uh, and then when you get that, you can't see the, 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 the sign, but it's there. And he's saying that's when you look at, then you look at his work uh, and I can't, carve it out from memory, but uh, the, the, the work is clearly about the fact that to be a column, you can't just be physically a column, you've got to look like it. Yeah, and then I think you have to add on top of that the layer that he also says the column is an interrupted wall, so he's inviting, right. there he's in, inviting you to think of it as something which it, it, you cannot see. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might we might come together after all, but you we will continue. <laughs> to be continued. Thanks, Peter. I'll send you an email and we'll get together. 
Okay, great. Thank you.